Okay, it's 6.30, we have a quorum. Good evening. We'll call the planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information, Mr. Dwyer. Uh, that would be Mr. Iser. Wonderful, thank you. Um, did you guys get my email today? The, the drawing of the the uh, the old Pateras Hotel yeah. there, Motel? 206 Russell Street, yes. Yes. Bill, is that something you can put on the screen? Okay, yes, Please. it is. Uh, let me see what I did with it. There you are. Okay. So let me see if I can make this work. How does that look? That looks awesome. Good job. You're hired. Okay, so this is 206 Russell Street, which currently is in a condominium situation. Uh, as Jimmy said, it was the old Pateras Plaza, Campus Pizza was there, a laundromat, etc. burned down several years ago. So the owner is trying to sell the empty portion of the lot. And from what I understand, they're going to dissolve the condominium and then create, create two lots. Uh, what I have shown as lot one and lot two. And the goal is to sell lot two to a separate entity other than the motel owner. And the reason I have this here for discussion this evening is to make sure that I'm calculating the parking in such a way that the board will be satisfied with what I'm doing. So what you see is green is green space or open space. And there is, I have a chart uh, at the top that talks about the open space and the parking, what's required based on the lot size and what is provided. And the green space is not a problem. And the parking based on what I have is not a problem. And I know uh, previously somebody thought that the motel parking was when, the, when both buildings were in operation, the motel parking was shy, uh, but it was the other way around. It was the motel had more than enough parking. It was sharing it with the other building due to the, <coughs> excuse me, hours of operation and such, it worked fine. Um, but anyhow, there, I believe there's enough parking space to satisfy the bylaw as long as you agree with the way I have it divided up. The white spaces are travel lanes that are 15 feet wide and the rest of it is parking area. So I just, again, wanna run that by you guys, make sure that I'm on the right headed in the right direction and let me know if I need to do anything differently. Okay, I think what, what the way you're calculating is correct, Randy, the way I can quickly look at it. The only concern that I have is that these two parcels were put together under site plan approval as a joint site plan. Yeah. I don't, we need to modify the site plan, I, I think even though parcel lot two is no longer there. But because it was approved as a single site plan, Mr. Dwyer, what do you think? Can we just amend the site plan from the original approval or do we have to hold a public hearing because it's a major change to change parking around? Well, I don't think we're really changing parking around. It's still, it's a still where it's always been, more or less. Right, but, but lot two, I mean, that's why I'm asking a question. Lot two, 
I know that they, we, they needed shared parking to satisfy the two parcels. And Randy may be right that lot two needed parking from the motel to satisfy the original Walter store parking, lack of a better term. Walter, the Walter store park building obviously is gone. Um, question is, it's still a joint site plan, the way it was presented. Can we just break it out and disregard that? Or how do we have to do that? Any ideas? Well, was it a joint site plan or a single site plan? It was a joint site. It was a site plan of the two parcels, but they, they shared parking, Mike. It was only, but Jimmy, it was only one parcel at the time. It was a, it was a condo situation. So it was one parcel with two buildings on it. And I don't know if that makes any difference in your thought process. So that was when, when the motel was being built, wasn't it? Or expanded because the strip mall was there anyway. Right. Right. And then the motel was, yeah, I don't remember. It must have been when the motel was being built. Um, and I think at the time, because the, the Walters building was so big, there was no way they were going to be able to do two lots and make all that parking work. So uh, I think you're right, Bill. I think it was when the, the motel was being built that this came to fruition. Um, and, and lot two has shown well, whoever some commercial entity wants to buy it, obviously they will have to come back before you for site plan approval when they come up with a design, et cetera. So I, I suspect that we would, we probably could um, amend the original site. Well, I wonder if we, I mean, because lot two is empty, the building isn't there. A lot of the conditions that were on it no longer apply because it's going to be a separate, lot two is going to have to stand oh. by itself now. Well, I'm not sure, Jim, that it's completely empty. There was this whole lighting issue, uh, which was pre, certainly predates me. And we have to figure out how to straighten that out finally. Uh, what is that again, Mike? The what? The light. Lighting. Lighting. Relative to what, Mike? He basically has these lights that were put up by whomever, and they were just brighter than the Dickens. Or the motel you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. They were pre... They, they dated apparently pre-code for approvable lighting outside, and that's going to have to be addressed. Well, if we're going to start bending stuff, uh, Mike, I thought that that got, I thought they moved the lights so they weren't infringing on the neighbors anymore. Yeah. No, they're still quite bright. No, they're they're still quite bright. They they, you know, it, it probably corrected the problem approximately fifty percent according to the person that it was, <laughs> Mr. Uh, what's his name? I just have I, I don't put any pictures up or anything. So Mike, listen. So we're going to have to make sure that, that, the, okay that. that the lighting is up to code. Outside outside lighting is up to code. We, we, this would be the time to do it. We, we can make yeah. this. We can, we can force them to address the lighting before we sign off on this approval not required. Well, I, I, I hope so. We want the lighting to be brought up to code. Outdoor lighting. The lighting, basically in the back green exactly i think there's two two tall lights uh that are still quite bright and they're, they're not they don't shine down they spread out yeah even though they they've been limited a little bit in in the back upper the northern trapezoid for lack of a better term randy yeah there's a couple there's a couple of lights that shine onto the senior housing out back okay and they've made them better but this is the opportunity to make them 100% correct and not shine at all onto the back senior corner. Okay. Understood what I understand what you're saying. Okay, but if you go to the 
far end of the senior housing and look over at the motel, you'll see which ones are talking about at night. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They're a lot better than they were, I, I want to say, 10 months ago. Um, but they still well, could be better. The Hadley, the Hadley building inspector got ever sourced to take care of part of the problem, but the problem's still there. It's just it's it's ameliorated a bit, but it's still not up to code and we should make it that, that are prerequisite of making any changes to the site plan, I think. All right. I will, I will tell the attorney involved from my side of it, what's going on and he can deal with it. Um, okay. and I'll, I'll tell him what needs to happen. Okay. Um, so okay. I, I think what would also be useful is to get some, as we try to figure out how we're technically going to deal with this to get um, some, certification from a site engineer that the drainage for this parcel will stand on its own because I don't remember how they were inter how much they were interconnected in the past. Okay. Yeah, that's true uh, too, yeah. I will look into that and see if there is drainage structures on lot 2. I can't tell from what I'm looking at what I'm looking at. So I will, I'll, I'll look into that as well. Um, and then the other, uh, if, I mean, if you have any other things, let me know. But one other thing that crossed my mind was there was concern about the widening of Route 9 and how that will impact. So in this situation, the only thing it would impact would be the green space. And it would not impact it enough, I don't believe, to put me under the uh, threshold, it will lessen the area of the lot and lessen the green space, but I, I think it, it's gonna be like a one for one kind of situation. So it should be fine there, so. And Randy, did Bill put you up to that question? No. No, Bill, Bill was uh, very diligent in checking with town council how the planning board should handle this. And Bill, thank you. The response from the town council will be not only enlightening to us, but to people like you who are gonna be confronting this issue. So, and, it, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, uh, I'm, so I'll, I'll let Bill uh, carry the- but Really really quickly on the green space though, uh, is it just gonna be grass or are we gonna have some plantings there? It is what it is, Mike. Uh, it, it's mostly grass. There's some plantings. I don't know exactly what it is. But Plant, plantings right on the road, Mike, are, are tough because they do. I'm they talking do. about in the back. I'm talking about more in the back. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, again, it's an, it's an existing situation. So I don't know, you know, how far you guys can, can push that. I think we're going to push it as far as we want. <laughs> well, we can. Bill, Bill, are you going to are you going to address the issue now? What uh, the town council told you, or sure, um, I can. Tr I'm going to try to get this up. Uh, I, I think we're probably done with this. Uh, what my plan, Bill? I think we've talked about it enough. I you answered. You guys answered my questions. Hopefully, I've gotten your concerns down so I can talk to the right people and get that squared away. <laughs> okay. I am uh, not. Um, okay. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I think that is correct. So I'll, let me just stop the share. Um, basically town council said that we would address an application before us on the basis of the situation on the ground when it is presented to us. So um, we would be looking at the project based on today, not some point in the future after the takings occur. Uh, however, having said that, I, I would certainly want to be very careful about not approving any drainage structures or other site improvements that, critical site improvements that encroached uh, in the uh, area to be taken. If you're gonna put a drainage structure and then you're gonna lose it 
uh, you, I don't see that you have a drainage problem. So something like that, I'd still want to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, one of the comments that was in the council's letter was about the grandfathering thing. And I didn't quite understand what they were saying. Yeah, explain it in English. Uh, does that mean <laughs> that it's not grandfathered, Bill? Let me let me pull that up. It's the partial M in a domain that, for example, takes the frontage. Rendis Randy, Randy, can you remind me what the street number is there on Russell Street? Two oh six, Mark. Thank you. I am just having trouble finding it at the moment. Well, I'll, I'll paraphrase it a little bit if that will help you, Bill. I have it, some notes. Uh, a partial imminent domain taking of a lot that renders the lot and structures non-conforming, renders the lot and the structures and protection is not enjoyed by 40A section 6, does not apply. So 40A section six must be the grandfathering. They, they are the grandfathering provisions. Now I have not had an opportunity to, to chase down that case. Uh, although I will add, it's a case from the land court, which is a trial court. So that's the lowest level. It has um, um, apparently was never appealed to a higher court. <clears throat> So it is instructive, but it is not binding precedent. Um, but okay. I think that would um, that would apply only on and after the takings. And um, so that means the applicant, such as Randy, could not say, "Well, this is grandfathered; or that's the way it's going to be," and it will revert back to the original thinking. We're going to rely on what's before us because some yep. of it may be green space and some of it may be, as you alluded to, uh, a drainage uh, situation. So that would be a lot different. And, so, and we're definitely going to be adding a caveat to the decision in where, where applicable that the um, application is at the person's own risk and they may not have any ability to expand in the future. Correct. That's a good point. Yeah. Fortunately, everybody involved in this one is aware of the takings and the potential issues. So I'm sure that uh, I will, whatever I do, I'm going to make sure it complies with today and with tomorrow, so to speak, uh, so that there is no issue from my end. But uh, I, and I doubt anybody's going to put any drainage structures in the front, front 10 feet, but we'll make sure that they are aware that they should not. Okay. Good job. All right. Thank you. Okay, I'm good. I'm good for now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No, I'm not sure who is here for other things later in the agenda, but in order of appearance, uh, Sandy. S A N D I. Are you with us, Sandy? Oh, move on. Okay, Bill. probably just interested. Uh, uh, Tracy? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Randy. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you're happy to see me. I am very. Thank you. I'm here with, with Sign Tech for Athleta on uh, 335 Russell Street for some signage to be approved. What, 331, Russell? 335. 335, Russell. That's Mountain Farm Small. Correct. It's suite A is an apple, dash 230. It's the old mattress firm. So, um, are you able to share the sign package that you sent? Yes. Okay, let me... Oh, sorry. Let me just authorize you here. Okay. Okay. 
you should be good. Can everybody see that? Yes. So that is the sign over the entrance door. Um, those are some more specs on the Halo Lit Channel letter set, which is um, was confirmed that it is smaller than what was existing for Mattress Firm. They were maxed out at the 40 square feet. This is 31.58. So we are less than what's These was. These are back, back, illuminated back lit letters? They are back, they're, they're called halo lit. So they are backlit. They just halo around the, the letters themselves. The letters are opaque. Correct. Okay. So you can see here the, um, does it work if I zoom in? I'm not sure. Um, yes, it does. Okay, perfect. Whoop. Right here at the bottom, it'll show you what it looks like at night. So there are no gooseneck lightings. They're just illuminated from the rear. That complies. What's the total um, area? Is it just this one sign or is there other signage? For the wall itself, it's just this one letter set at 31.58 square feet. And then I'm also applying for um, refacing of existing panels in the pylon ground signs. Um, here, let me do this. Whoops, too small. Um, so this first one, the larger one, it's gonna be towards the bottom where mattress firm was. So it's exactly the same size at 20 square feet. And then the next one is Again, probably where Mattress Firm was at two by 10 at 20 square feet, right under Michael's. Just as an aside, which I don't think affects jurisdiction in any way, uh, Mattress Firm is not leaving the mall. So I'm, huh. uh, they're moving into an out parcel on the mall, out building on the mall parcel. Okay. So you may want to verify that they are willing to part with their signage or that management is willing to part with their signage. Okay. It looks like um, from this sketch that we had in the survey, there's blank space in there. So I will, we'll make sure that it is blank. Cause if they are, if they want to keep their signs on the marquees at the road, there's not room for your signs to go out there. Correct. And you won't be allowed to put more signs. Right. It looks like you guys are maxed out there. So just be aware of that. Okay. Okay. I'll make, I'll double check with my contact. So we'll approve your building sign. Okay. Um, but I'm hesitant to, re to approve the marquee sign because it's unknown what's happening there. Okay. So if you could come back with me at our next meeting and let us know. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Any other comments from the board on this? No, I think that covers it. Motion to approve the building sign. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the building sign, um, but not to a uh, building sign package, but not to approve the pylon signage until we know that mattress firm is going to be is willing to get, will be removed. Okay. okay. I will second that. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I will notify the building inspector of the building sign, Tracy. And uh, go from there. All right, sounds good. I'll check with my project okay. manager and see what's going on with those. And we'll see you at the next meeting. Okay, that'll be in two weeks from tonight. Correct. Okay.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer, next. Next. Uh, I believe we have, uh, well, we had Lionel, but I think he's here for something else. Um, so that would bring us to Philip. Oh, hi, how are you? Hi. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about the, the um, proposed um, uh, in-law apartment that we wanna build at 113 Middle Street. Um, uh, basically, I'm just, I think I'm just checking in here. I'm not 100% sure what I, what I need to, uh, to bring before you guys here, maybe run down the list of what's, uh, of what's, uh, what's been done or what, what needs to be done just to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, we, uh, we have, uh, an, we have an approval from the select board about the uh, driveway issue. Uh, we have a license agreement. Um, we've drafted and I think, think, think that's about done. Um, I just heard from Conservation Commission about how far away we are from the culvert that um, needs to be more than 100 feet or whatever we're doing on our property needs to be about 100 feet. And we are, we are uh, over 100 feet from it. So uh, pending any changes that they seem to be okay with that uh, based on an email I just got uh, a couple hours ago. Uh, there's also the, uh, zoning variance, getting our, um, the, whatever we're doing is, 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 uh, about 43, a little more than 43 feet back from the, the sidewalk, um, which is the same distance back that our main house is. And, uh, I believe that one has been taken care of as well or agreed to, um, trying to think if there's anything else. Um, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> Was there any any questions at this point? I, I I was told I needed to come before you guys tonight, but I wasn't exactly sure what I needed to to okay. bring. What, what we oh. need is a plot plan that you, you yeah. this is a building addition, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. We'll need a plot plan showing the building addition. Okay, yeah. What will the building look like after it's done? Mm -hmm. Some kind of an architectural drawing. Okay. With yep. colors. And because you're on sewer, you're all set you're on sewer, correct? Yeah, we're going to be on yeah town sewer. Not okay. at, so we don't we don't need anything. There's nothing nothing to worry about with a septic. If you had a septic system, there'd be some more. You need something for the board of health, but you're on sewer, so you're all set with that. Um, we need where you need to have, I think it's three parking spaces for the property. So mm -hmm. on the plot plan, just show where the parking spaces are going to be. Okay. 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 And two sets of abutters on mailing labels or envelopes. Your your choice, whichever is easier. Two sets of a can you explain that are everybody within 300 feet of the outside right. radius of your property. Go to the board of go to the board of assessors. They know how to give you that. There's Actually, probably, I, well, I did that. I sent letters to everybody. You did that you for the did, variance. You probably already did that for the zone of for the zoning board variance. Okay, this is for this is a, a separate part of it. Yeah, so we need two we need two more sets of those abutters. Okay. So okay. specifically what we're doing is you have to file an application for a special permit mm -hmm. and we have to schedule a public hearing, publish a notice in the newspaper. It's very much the same process as you went through right. with the ZBA, okay. but yeah. um, you couldn't do that with us because you did not have, you weren't ready the last right. time your uh, builder came in to see us. Right. Uh, I think the uh, plot plan that you your builder presented at the outset is probably pretty much good enough for, for all of this. Hardly changed. Yeah. So, um, but, um, but yeah, you, you do need to initiate a new application for the, uh, the special permit. Okay. Do we have right. your mailing? Do we have your email address, Philip? Uh, cer not. Certainly folks do there. Uh, I can. We don't, I can. We don't, we don't, why don't want to hear it over the TV? No, I, I wasn't. I wasn't going to tell you that. So why don't, why don't you just send uh, me an email at planning okay. at hadleyma.org? Okay. All right. I will do we'll, that. We'll send you the application. Okay. Um, you can put a package to scan a package together, and if you're if you were to be ready in two weeks, um, you can you can file it. 
at our next meeting and okay. we'll schedule a hearing probably for the second meeting middle of april okay all right yeah all right i'll get all that together for you okay what's the street number again on middle 113 middle street yeah thank you all right thanks very much everybody okay you're welcome have a good night good night uh let's see i have a uh, mark britain probably here for the next thing uh i have rob baronowski um not sure if you have you're here for the river um nicole percume hi hi oh. I'm here on behalf of Birkin Construction to get lots released in his subdivision in North Hadley, Shattuck Estates, and Sapphire Estates. Um, I emailed the plans to you, Bill. Do you have them? Uh, yes. Okay. So let me get into... Um, Okay, um, yeah. Okay, let me see now if I can do this. And okay, yep. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll get to the next one if we need to. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is Crystal Lane in Nikki's Way. Um, so on Crystal Lane, he is asking the board to release lots, the, the lots that are circled, lots one, two, three, and eight. Um, and then if you can just scroll down, Bill, please. Okay, one. What a one, two, one, two, three, and eight. Yeah, so that would release all the lots in this subdivision. The remaining lot that would be left unreleased is on the next plan for Shattuck Estates on Indian Pipe Drive. It's lot four. Okay. And part of the documents I had sent Bill, which are just a little bit further down, include bids for paving. He's putting the final coat on Crystal Lane on Indian Pipe Drive and Nikki's Way this summer. So I just have a copy of the quotes here because he's picking a paving company soon and planning on completing the roads to be given to the town for Indian Pipe and Nikki's Way. So lot four will remain. Yep, that's a large lot that's remaining. So between all these lots, we're only going to hold one in Covenant? So, so if you look down to the next, um, the, the bids for the paving, to finish the paving, are 43.6, uh, 42.9, and 38.6. Yep, for Indian Pipe Drive and Nikki's Way. And on, on, February excuse me, on February 24th, you asked us to release at this meeting tonight lots 8 and 15. And then you send us this email today asking us to release 1, 2, 3, and 8. 
eight. So 15 is released. I couldn't find a record of eight being released. Unless I'm wrong. If eight is already released, then he would just want one, two, and three released. Well, Mike, what date did you have for? On the 24th, of what Cole sent an email saying, please release so many words, lot eight, lot eight and 15. 24th of what? When? February, this year, February 24th, 2021. I have a... Um... I have the certificate of performance, but it's dated March 19th, 2019, releasing lots five, six, and 15. So, uh, yeah, if, so you're saying there was an email that uh, in February 24th, that was after our second February meeting. That was just a request then. And yeah, it was a request. So are you, are you amending your request by this new request? Am I, I, yeah, I might be. You're correct. I had emailed Bill today clarifying exactly what my request was. We was. didn't vote on that prior request. No, but... no, no, no. It just changed within a week. So I'm just wondering if there was a mistake or just that's okay. I know that the most recent lot we had released was lot four. So Bill or Jim, uh, do you want to explain to the newer members on the board, as well as to the listening audience, the difference <coughs> between releasing a lot after the town meeting acceptance and th these two lots? Um, I mean, the, uh, from my understanding, this subdivision was put in prior to our new subdivision regulations. The older subdivision regulations, which this one comes under, was that we would hold a lot until the driveway and the way is completed according to the satisfaction of the engineers. And under the new subdivision, we want it to be accepted by the town before we release the last lot. So if, if I'm correct, this is under the old subdivision regulations. And I think Jim's concern is that, is the paving of all the streets sufficient enough to cover that lot four? Or will lot four cover the paving? Or should we wait until the final? There has to be an engineering, uh, uh, check two after the final code is put in before we release lot four. Yeah. Correct, Bill? Correct. But I, yes, that's the process. I, I believe lot four is uh, almost an acre and three quarters. <clears throat> uh, it's a little hard to, uh, it's a little hard to break out um, lot prices because a lot of the lots in here are sold with built to suit structures on them. But um, I know that in the subdivision across the street, which is a little less dense, the uh, parcels are selling in the $170,000 range. And the bids for uh, the final paving are in the, the mid-40s. So uh, this is know, where all the roads in both subdivisions would be would be final coat paving for 43 something. No, it's Crystal Lane still is being under construction. So Crystal Lane would not be paved until it's construction is complete to avoid. How many, lots, how many lots are in Crystal Lane are we holding then? Um, none. We are you're hold right now at the moment. You're holding one, two, three and eight but that's what he's seeking release of because beforehand he didn't need the lots released in order to obtain a building permit. But now in order to obtain a building permit, he needs the lots released. So let me, so what is the paving for? The paving is for Nikki's way. So that's the cul-de-sac right there. 
off of Crystal Lane, all those lots are fully built and sold. So that road is done. And then it has, it has a final code on it. He's going to put a final code on it this summer. That's what the bids are. Yep. So the bids are for Nikki's Way and Indian Pipe Drive. And Indian Pipe Drive is on the next plan. That's Indian Pipe Drive. So, Indian Pipe Drive is 100% complete except for Lot 4. It's where the loom pile is. So the quote does not include doing Indian Head Drive. Nope. The quote includes Indian Pipe Drive and Nikki's Way. But not, not Crystal Lane. No. And so how are we covering the cost? And we don't know the cost of paving. Yeah. Crystal well, Crystal Lane and Indian Pipe Drive are comparable in size. So there's no way that it could be more than the price of Lot 4. They're comparable. No, we don't know that. Um, be only because building costs are going so out, out of sight. I, I, so the the find the the, the forty something thousand that you've got there, the three quotes that, that are below are for yeah, paving. They all average about forty grand, and they're for Indian Pipe Drive and Nikki's Way. Indian pipe. What? So you've got a base coat on Indian pipe and actually do you have a base coat on all of these? Yeah, they they all have a base coat. Okay. So for Indian pipe and Nikki's way, we're looking at 40 ish. And you're saying that those two combined is comparable to crystal lane. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it's an in two, streets in yeah. crystal lane is only one street it's longer a little bit than indian pipe but not by much okay. the last one of the last times crystal lane came before us for something i don't know if it was the parcels a and b or whatever there was some discussion about the fact that there had been a emergency services call and trucks went to two different places. One went to Bristol and one went to Crystal Lane. And we had talked about, could you change Crystal Lane to Crystal Way so that it wouldn't sound over the dispatcher the same as Bristol Lane? Is that anything that might move forward or? Um, my husband was in on that call, Andrew Beth. So I have, I'm not sure. Okay. So the quote is to do Indian pipe, yep. but not Crystal Lane. And yeah. at the end of Nikki Way. He's waiting to put the top coat on Crystal Lane because lots still need to be developed on Crystal Lane. So the no, go down because you're jumping up about back and forth. I, I I can't see the do we have this thing someplace I can look at? So let me see if I can shrink this a little bit so you can see both panels at once. Yeah, they're two separate plans. Yeah, so it's hard. So the top plan is yeah. Nikki's Way and Crystal, and the bottom is Indian Pipe. So there's a little bit of apples and oranges here just because the uh, plan at the top is actually an approval not required plan uh, or an existing lines plan. Uh, it's not a copy of the original subdivision plan. Um, but I believe the idea was uh, th these were set up as two separate subdivisions, were they not? Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't think we can release all of the lots on Crystal Lane <clears throat> because, uh, that's a separate subdivision and that's where your apples and oranges comes in. Yeah. That's where we should be keeping, uh, we should be keeping a lot in each subdivision, even though I know you're treating them as if they are one big subdivision, but they weren't permitted that way. They weren't, they weren't applied for that way. They weren't permitted that way. 
Okay, so you want to keep lot four and then one lot in Crystal Lane? Correct. Okay. Do you want me to tell you which lot that is now? I would have to talk to my dad to verify which lot. I know your dad wants the permit for uh, lot eight. So just make sure that's not the one held. It would yeah, be I, I think I already had, I had an inclination. I've been thinking lot three he'll keep. Um, so, so bear in mind that if you do want to substitute either a cash bond or a letter mm -hmm. of credit, you have the ability to do that under the subdivision statute. Okay, so I'll probably provide a letter of credit then. Yeah, it's your election how you provide performance security. Most people do the, um, the covenant because it has no upfront cost. But um, if you want to, uh, I, I have no problem uh, if you want to ask for a release of a couple of them uh, or even just, just the one. I don't know which ones you're actually applying for building permits on. I know definitely lot eight and I'm having an inclination. It's going to be one and two and eight that he's going to build this summer. We do supply a letter of credit. It needs to be a non-cancelable letter of credit. Okay. That's fine. Or a cash bond. I'll ask him which he would prefer, but I'm thinking the letter of credit. And, and how much this, should the letter of credit for be, be for? It would be for an amount. Uh, Probably. You need to do the same thing, get get bids for finishing the work. Okay. So and, the bids are Cave Crystal Lane. And then well, uh, with... Uh, but, if we hold, but if we hold a lot, we have essentially more than the cost of doing the construction. Right. We've got but, quite a buffer. But the, but the cash bond or the letter of credit is an acceptable form and it's right in the, and it's right in the subdivision ranks how to do it. I just want to make sure it's enough. Yes. So in order to get all the lots released on Crystal Lane, you, you would like a letter of credit equal to an amount? Probably something like two and a half times the amount of the estimate for paving Crystal Lane. Good. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, the, 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 uh, Security covers more than just the final coat. It also includes, let's say, the drainage doesn't work, or something like that. Is it includes yeah. possible corrections to drainage, etc.? Yep, it has to be a functioning road. Yep. Okay, so a letter of credit. Um, okay. So, uh, so what are, what are you looking for? One, two, and eight. One, two, and eight, if we could get those released tonight, is that, was that agreeable? And then I can come back for three with the letter of credit? Yes, that is, that is correct. Okay. So you um, release, release one, two, and eight tonight, and you could come back in two weeks for the number three, and even if you want to do the other one, you have a lot. Okay. Yep. So I'll make a motion no. to release lots one, two, and eight at this time. Yep, so I'll, I have the certificate of performance drafted and I'll just get it signed by you, Bill, like before. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. Now, just backtracking, which financial institution will be issuing that letter of credit? I don't know. I have to ask my well, I just Yeah, I want to make sure it's one acceptable to us. We don't, you know, okay. Yeah. Massachusetts Bank. <clears throat> <Okay. clears throat> So we're not, we're not at that point yet. So we're just here for, do I have a second on that motion? Second, second, yeah. We have a motion and a second. Could you release your, yeah, okay. Motion and a second, uh, any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Nicole, okay. actually, before, before you left, Nicole, I just wondered if the board could just give their opinion on um, the police department really had a concern with the you no know, dispatch sending the wrong. It happened more than once to Bristol mm -hmm. and Crystal Lane. So their thought was if there was any chance, you know, and, I, and the uh, board could give their opinion on if changing Crystal to Crystal Road. Um, 
you know, it happened at least twice that we know of that dispatch went, you know, through the name the wrong place. Yeah. Okay. So you want, you want me to talk to my client about that? Yeah. Something that does not sound in remotely like lame. Yeah. Crystal way or crystal rule. And I would say either one probably would probably be acceptable. Wouldn't it Mike? Yeah. Um, okay. That's something Andrew was on the meeting for. So I don't have a lot of information on that. I know he spoke. I don't even know if he spoke to my father about it yet or not, but I wasn't on that meeting. So, but I can talk to him and get back to you when I provide the letter of credit. Okay. We well, can let us know what the next meeting, um, uh, Nicole. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And oh, while we're yeah, well, while if we have we have it at a time, um, the I believe uh, the Hadley garage has requested an extension to the third Tuesday in April. Bill, correct. I'll obtain a motion to. Accept the request for continuance to April 20th. I'll make a motion to accept the request for continuance to April 20th. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Good. Okay. Next up for general information. Um, I had Robert Feiden Kevitz. I don't see him here. Yeah, he's here. Oh, yeah, yes, there I'm, he is. I'm here for the river. Okay. okay. Um, do we want to... Um, do we want to talk about the accessory apartment? Uh, oh, yes. Mailing pickup? Yeah, what, what happened was when we had the Henderson public hearing for the accessory apartment at our last meeting... I had mailed out the request the prior week on Thursday, I believe, figuring that the people would get the request, the public notice on Friday. Good old mail, from what, I, from what Bill and I can tell, everybody got the notice the day after the public hearing. And it took them almost exactly a week to get the notice out when they were mailed. Most of them were local, it was put into the Amherst Dropbox in front of the post office. Um, I had kind of forgot about getting them out earlier than that, but that still should have been enough notice to get them out. And we got a couple of requests for other information. I talked to one person over the phone about a lot, lot line dimension, and that was all straightened out. Um, they were good with what we was what was on the drawings, but just to cover our bases and be safe. Bill and I suggest, Bill suggested it that we reopen the public hearing and I will re mail the abutters the continue, the reopening of the public hearing just in case somebody has a concern or a question that can get answered. And probably I'll mail them out in the next couple of days and it can be held on uh, the March. 16th planning board meeting because right now there's nothing on that meeting. And Anybody have any, any objection to that? I no. think that sounds reasonable. Sounds fair. Yep. Okay. I will get that notice out of reopening. I'm not going to put it in a newspaper. I'm just going to put it out to the abutters so that we can answer any questions and I'll let the Hendersons know what we're doing. Okay, I'll make a motion to reopen the public hearing and to continue it to April 16, 2020. No, March 16. March 16. March 16. March 16 for this. And I will second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Just for the record, I won't I'm I don't think I'm gonna be at the 16th meeting, but you don't need me. You can do this. As long as the four of you show up, you can, you can uh, make the motion and, and conduct the meeting. 
Okay, next up, Mr. Dwyer. It, uh, that's all I have for the, uh, the walk-ins, I believe, unless there's anyone else that has administrative business with the planning board. Is everybody else, is anybody else here not for the riverfront that's listening? I guess not. Okay. We can talk about the riverfront. So there have been, uh, there's a meeting of the Riverfront Advisory Committee last Tuesday, which was very well attended. Um, and we discussed, uh, it, it's actually pretty uh, illuminating as well. Um, uh, we discussed the bylaw that we're being, that we're proposing, but also the other issues that are uh, facing the Riverfront and it turns out to be a lot more complicated than zoning, which is why I'm glad that our uh, fearless uh, building inspector is taking the lead on this. Um, I've sent around various things. There are some maps of um, what is considered floodway versus floodplain. Uh, one of the maps goes back to uh, Alexander Dawson. Um, and I also sent around the uh, campground regulations. Um, so if you uh, are dumb, if you, if you have land on the river and you rent to more than, to three or more people, you are a campground under the jurisdiction of the Board of Health. Um, if you move a blade of grass within 200 feet of the mean high water mark, you are uh, under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. And uh, so with all of that going on, I'm wondering, um, well, first of all, there's some things we haven't completely resolved. The question of one, one camper by right, or, or one camper or multiple, uh, I'm almost thinking that with the Conservation Commission and the Board of Health on top of the uh, riverfront, as well as the, uh, the fire department, depending on what, how much propane you're storing down there and whether or not it's on, attached to a vehicle or not, um, I'm almost thinking we don't have to really work through the ZBA too much on this one. Uh, I don't know if anyone has a, a different feeling. Work, work through too much of the, what did you say, Bill? I don't know if we have to involve the ZBA. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what role the ZBA would have when the Conservation Commission and the Board of Health and the Fire Department, uh, not to mention the building inspector as the flood uh, management officer, um, th th there's already a pretty pretty heavy regulatory label, a, la a layer on anything down by the river. And um, I'm just not sure what the ZBA brings to the table at this point. Well, who would, who would regulate how many trailers per lot? Planning board or a special permit. Well, we could talk about setting that into the bylaw. Okay. I, I'm trying to avoid creating a need for a lot of hearings yeah. on something that really doesn't require our involvement on a case by case basis. That's why we sent it off to the ZBA in the first place because they're more suitable, to, suited for doing things on a, you know, one-on-one -on -one scale versus our expertise is more on the big picture bylaw and then the technical details of site plan approval. What if we yeah, set parameters? Every, excuse me. If we set the parameters of what would perhaps be the building inspector's authority to say yay or nay, uh, Perhaps that would be sufficient. Well, I, I, I'm kind of I agree with Bill. We don't need to put a layer of regulation in if it's not going to get us anywhere. The public hearing 
is for the abutters and neighbors primarily for their input. And down there on the river, I doubt most of the abutters to a riverfront property have too much of a concern. It's the, the biggest concern that I have is, and I've heard this from a number of farmers, is that sometimes various people down on the river are stealing vegetables on a farm and they make us, they, they, they don't take care of some of the farm. I know a lot of the river from people say oh, that's not true. Well, I've heard from farmers that says it is true. Um, but you, you don't necessarily know that it's the people that are, have their campers down there. I mean, people just drive down there and steal stuff. That's absolutely true. I do not disagree with There's, that one bit, Mike. Yeah. Um, however, holding a public hearing and the, with either the ZBA or the planning board as the issuing authority isn't going to change that. It's not really going to address the vegetables and stuff getting stolen or, or land getting trampled on. I mean, you're going to, you're going to, we're going to see something once we're going to get concerned, but we really can't, how can you possibly put teeth into the approval to say they can't do that? That's enforceable. What if, for example, we leave the ultimate authority to the building inspector, but this is going to have to pass the town meeting. And what if we set up the parameters, for example, Mark Dunn's idea was a good one, have uh, you know, the square and have some certain amount of frontage on the river. Uh, and that way, at least there'd be something to go by. And you would be addressing the concern that people have, well, I've got 30 acres along the river and somebody's got four and they want the same number of campers. That shouldn't be. So uh, we've got to set some parameters so that when people have the town meeting, they'll know what they're voting on at least. Well, I, I agree with that. We, we've got to set some limits, some, some, yes. some parameters. I'm not sure what the, right, the, what the correct word is, but we've got to have a basis so that um, we don't put the building inspector in correct. a tight spot where he's going to get hammered. Well, you let this guy, you let this guy, I want this, I want that. Um, he, I'm sure he has no, the issuing authorities, Building Inspector Conservation Board of Health will be willing to do what they need to, but they also, we don't want to put them in the position where it appears to be some kind of, you know, they're acting as too much of a judge. It, it, it'd be it'd be nice if we knew what was going on now to determine if that was reasonable rather than trying to determine what's unreasonable, which we really don't know. We don't know what's going on now. We don't know how many vehicles are per lot or we just don't know. You almost got to do a survey to figure out what's going on before you come up with some regulation. I I've not seen any of them, but I've heard again and again and again people saying that there's a history of certain areas being jammed up. And I don't know if that's the areas which have a, a low accessible beach versus a drop off. I, I, I don't know that, but I've just yeah. heard. That, that would be just kicking the can down the road. We know there's many, many trailers that are parked down there that are not permitted. There is a bylaw in place that they should have to go before the ZBA for a special permit. No one has been applying for it and that the in zoning enforcement officer just ignored it. So Harry Mason, Harry Mason would say that's hearsay. It's not hearsay. <laughs> Those are facts. Well, I walked away from our last meeting and the, a couple of the takeaways I had were one, we were concerned about the town's liability with the floodway and the floodplain and federal insurance and things like that. Um, life safety, we don't want trailers or whatever camping devices washing down the river. Um, and uh, I think I heard people talk about concern about 
you know, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll set a definition of RV as it has to be roadworthy and able to drive out at a moment's notice if a flood event is impending. Um, so I am happy to offer for, you know, you can blow holes in it or whatever, but I, I just kind of made a, an initial diagram that could be turned into verbiage if it were, if it made sense um, of just a starting point for discussion. And I'd be happy to share it if anyone has any interest. And it just kind of talks about, it shows river frontage and it provides a spacing between RVs. So that ad addresses conge uh, congestion and also, you know, fire and emergency access. Um, you know, things that again, life safety, liability, you know, if someone couldn't be pulled out of there during a fire, could they sue the town that we didn't enforce, you know, reasonable separation of uh, d dwellings, you know. So Mark, do you want me to pull that up for you? Uh, I've got it if you want to let me try and share, but if, if that, you know, I'm willing to try if you give me the privilege, but uh, my my spectrum is questionable here, but it's... Okay, give it a try. Okay. So if I go to share screen, and I think this is the one I want. Let me know if it pops up. Are you seeing the draft? Yeah. Yep. So uh, I don't know if that's big enough, if you're able to see, to see it, but I kind of, so I just, I drew up an imaginary river edge and I didn't get into dimensions of where the floodway and the floodplain is and all that, but I just kind of, obviously you're in the floodway here. And then I took a, a typical RV. Um, I drew them at eight and a half wide by 45 long. Um, and I put out two foot pop outs on, on each side just to cover all the options. And I said, what if we wanted to keep 30 feet between them? And I just took that out of, and again, I, my experience is with buildings and they like to have a fire lane between buildings. And, um, so I, I said 30 feet and that's up, up for discussion. If we said 30 feet between. And so then you need 15 feet to your property line so that your neighbor could have 15 feet and you'd maintain, th maintain 30. Based on that, I came up with, you have one, I think our, our, our bylaws say you're allowed one RV by right on, on your lot if you meet all the, the conservation, the planning, you know, all, all that other stuff. And if you wanted to go to a, add a second one on your site, I, by my calculations, it, you, would, you would have to have 85 feet of river frontage. And that's the 30, 15, the 15, and these two at uh, eight and a half, 10 and a half, 12 and a half each. So, um, and I don't know what the setback is. That's more complicated. I just for diagram purposes, I said, you know, 50 feet from the river edge, but that's good. That's obviously more conservation commission or safe practices, you know, depending on what the topography is. Um, I, I wasn't going to, I don't know that we even have to address that. Um, so anyway, that was just, th this was something I was looking at that if we put something, some language like this, that, um, I think we currently say you're allowed one per lot, but once you want to go more, if we said you need to maintain a minimum um, spacing bet between them and a, call it a side yard, you know, uh, a side setback, um, then that would be, I think, enforceable. It, I don't know if it'll be popular, but I think it, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to balance the town's and the owner's safety concerns and also keep in mind that the owners and their guests 
uh, enjoyment. So I, I also think if you, I mean, I, if you get closer than 30 feet, um, that might be fine if it's you and your cousins or your best friend, but if it's your, some other neighbor and it's more than 30 feet or less than 30 feet, you might not be happy. So uh, I'm sure there will be opinions on that. So um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good starting point for discussion and the fact that we have to use the riverfront as frontage and, uh, but of course, uh, you're looking for accessibility for fire engines uh, and other safety, you know, ambulances. If you have to cut down trees, you probably could not cut the trees down. So how would you handle that? Because it's the Conservation Commission's authority to handle that. Well, again, like you said, Joe, this is a good point. We're only concerned. What if they, what if they wanted to put the RVs parallel to the river? river? Another, another something to look at. However, um, like Bill said, cutting trees down and everything else, that all falls under conservation and a whole different ball, ballywick, if you would. Yeah. And we can't address those in a bylaw. They're going to say you've got to comply with, con we're going to put in the bylaw that you must comply with conservation, board of health, building inspector, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and this is a guide. A minimum guide. Now, think, you know, Mark, Mark, could, uh, you know, Mark, what I would like you to do, and you, you probably have the ability to do it, uh, go on Google Earth and find out from the Connecticut, well, you probably should go from, from the Sunderland line all the way to the South Hadley line. What's the potential number of trailers? This seems rather tight. And we're looking at five to 600 trailers, maybe more parked there. And if a July flood like came several years ago comes up, it's gonna be a traffic jam. It's gonna be a very congested trying to get them out of harm's way, you know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we'd have and to ask, you know. If, if, if it's an event brought on by rain, then I don't know if there's, you know, if, if the roads will even be you know, they, they might get stuck in the mud, you know. No, I, I know, and, and Hatfield had this situation where they were putting a uh, culvert in on the Mill River close to the, uh, where it goes into the Connecticut River, and they found the swedge mussel there, and they had to take the culvert out. Over the weekend, there was a, a lot of heavy rains. They left the excavator, and the excavator was flooded about three quarters of the way above up, up to the top of the cab wow. so the water can come up fairly quickly uh but i think it's a good start mark and and i think this is the way we have to approach it i don't know what do the other people say uh i, I think I if you have, now if you have three trailers there and it could also be something we don't adopt maybe tommy adopts it himself or or you know or some some variation I think also if you did what, what, what Jim says, and if you turn them 90 degrees and you start going back from the river, then you maybe do something like Joe and I talked about the square that you, you say only so many per, per acreage, you know. Well, for, for, the, for, the, for the clearances, Mark, I think what we need to do, is, this is really one for the, uh, probably the fire department. Yeah. What would they like to? What would they require for clearance between RVs? Right. You know, because we would, the one thing we don't want to do is say minimum thirty, and the build and the fire chief says, "Well, I really like to see fifty or sixty, right? Thirty-five or forty or whatever it might be." We just want to make sure, like it, it's a good. You got you got a, a very good design start point here. At least it's a good discussion, and I think we can build on this a lot. And still be reasonable of what we come up with. I know we have a good size audience tonight, and there's probably more who will hear about it secondhand. You know, we're not trying to hurt anyone. We're not trying to take anyone's uh, freedom of enjoyment away. We're just trying to keep everyone safe in the sandbox. Well, to, to, to Bill's point, if we can put some reasonable regulations in the bylaw and avoid special 
permits by either the ZBA or the planning board and leave it up to the building inspector and the appropriate boards, I think it's going to be a lot cleaner, cleaner and better for everybody involved. And we're more likely to get the permitting process done if they don't need to go through a bunch of hoops with town boards, sure. like the public hearing stuff. So I do also want to get across that just because for zoning purposes, we say it's okay to have two or more RVs down there. That does not mean that you are able to have two or more RVs down there. If the Conservation Commission says you can't have it where you want it, you can't have it where you want it. It's not a zoning issue. They have a separate, uh, they have separate statutory authority. So whatever we say is, is not the last word. That it, there's multiple words after hours on this case. And yeah. also, too, it really has to pass the mustard of the Massachusetts Flood Authority. Uh, used to be FEMA. Now Massachusetts has the authority to, uh, to reject it or not. But I did talk to Joy Dupernot, who is the head of the uh, Massachusetts board, and she said, we're not going to be as tough as the FEMA sanctions. That is, we won't take your flood insurance away. We won't take your uh, ability to borrow money from a bank away. Uh, we're not sure how federal money will be allotted if it has to be done in the area. We will work with you. We'll be kinder and gentler. So... Uh, that's kind of good news. If, if it does not pass their mustard, they'll help us along too. But it's not going to be the uh, strict sanctions that the uh, federal government and FEMA put on the town in 1975 if we did not pass it. So if, Mark, if you could take that down so we could get back to having more people on the screen. Um, if anybody else, if you're ready for public comments, Jim, uh, at the bottom of your panel in your Zoom window, there is a um, emoticon, a smiley face that says reactions. <clears throat> and within reactions, one of them is raise hand. I'll do it now just so you can see what it looks like. Okay. Somebody else figured it out too. Rob has so, uh, if anybody, Jim, I'll just, I just want to be sure people know how to do that. So we have one hand up. Oh, we have two hands up now. Where do you see the hands, Bill? In the upper left hand left corner, corner of the window. Yeah. Of their Hollywood Square. Do you see it? Yeah. Are you in speaker or uh, gallery? Uh, yeah. If you go to your in gallery. Yeah. Okay. You... In gallery. Then... I see Lionel, Rob, Rick, and Robert have all raised their hands. Do you not see that, Jim? No. And Sandy, oh, Sandy's was up and down. Okay. So want me to just call them off in the, in the order they appear on my screen? Okay. Okay. Rob Fighting Kevitz. Yeah, I was just curious if you might know like what spacing regulations the campground falls under. You know, that might be something good to look into to see what kind of spacing regulations they would have to have. Mm -hmm. Um, this like, is Rob Baranowski. I, I can answer that question. 105 CMR 440 says 1,200 square feet per camper and 200 square feet per parking. So it's 1,400 square feet in the uh, campgrounds, family style campgrounds or public campgrounds. I would, I would also be curious to know, um, like as a snowmobiler, when we get a SAMS pass, I think we waive a lot of the liability for the landowners. Um, if that could be, you know, why couldn't that be a part of your permitting process? 
who can waive the liability for the town? That's a good question. I don't know if we can do that, but that is something. Uh, Isn't that a state regulation or law that, that we'll, we'll ask town council? Yeah. I don't know how it works, but I just know that that's what happens. I, I was wondering, I'm just curious. Um, so if you're done, Rob, could you just click the, if you go back to that button, you can click lower hand. I'm sorry, Robert. And then Rob Baranowski. Uh, good evening. Uh, so many places to begin. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, I think I've said it in one other meetings or a couple. Um, the FEMA regulations first for the firm, the flood insurance program. Um, FEMA just really talks about exactly what someone said on the board, wanting the vehicles being able to move within 24 hours. They have to be licensed. They have to be roadworthy, single chassis that sort of stuff. Um, so really that is the requirement for FEMA. FEMA never says one, two, five, ten RVs per lot. So I just wanted to throw that out there. From a perspective of number of campers per lot, uh, I don't know if you're going to get into a, a conflict with the 105 CMR 440. I just mentioned that Mr. Dwyer sent me I read that extensively, and, and again, that says basically, and, and there are a couple other reasons, Mr. Dwyer, you can have public campgrounds. It's not all for profit, it's for philanthropic or whatever that word is, and charitable also reasons. So it's not just public campgrounds um, for profit. They do call it family-style camping in that particular law. So I just wanted to say that that says, again, the only thing they're saying is that 1,400 square feet, basically. And now if you're saying, you know, somebody goes out and says, okay, I do want the three or more, it's going to have to go through Board of Health, um, local Board of Health. And that because they're the ones who actually permit that is local Board of Health. And will that then be in conflict? Which overriding factor is going to take place? Is it now the 1,400 square feet or is it the, the example we just saw there? Um, 25, 3,000 square feet. I don't think anybody's going to be actually asking to open up a public campground for profit through this permitting process. But a lot of it is actually the same regulations that the River Commission Advisory Board just talked about. Um, and, it, you know, with fire on, with, you know, sanitation, health department, and that they're just really talking about they want to make sure everything's obviously compliant um, so I'm just wondering if you're going to run into a conflict if, for now the people that do actually go through the health department. And I'm actually worried about the health department getting inuated with permit requests because now it's kind of saying, OK, well, planning or zoning is going to go saying just two campers. Well, you may have 10, 15 properties that are going to say, well, then we'll go this other route for the family style campgrounds and just inuate them with. And I know they don't have any hired staff. And then they're going to actually be the ones to police it. So I just want to throw that out there. And just maybe my third point is the, the, the offset that we're talking about, that 30 feet. I think the number that was thrown around at the River Advisory Council was 25 feet. And that was uh, Board of Health threw that out there for health reasons, the distancing for health reasons. And fire was on it at that point. They were on the meeting. And they didn't seem to have an issue with that 25 feet rather than 30 feet. I know it's semantics, little numbers, but I just wanted to throw that out there that that was discussed at one of the other meetings. As you can see, I'm kind of joining all these meetings. So a lot of stuff. I don't know if I had a question or I just wanted to point out some things. So, Tom, will you make sure that we remember to ask um, the chief as well as the Board of Health about the spacing? Yes, yes. I was going to bring that up that it, it did get brought up 25 feet. That's what I had in my notes. Um, that, and I believe that was Board of Health. But Bill, didn't you say that the plant, the uh, health health board only gets involved if the, the lots are being rented? If it's well, for it, seems, profit? it seems that if you are, if you own a parcel, uh, you could be there. But if you, if you, 
I, I would have to go back to the regulations, which I did send to everyone. Um, I believe it says if you if you are hosting more than two for profit, you are subject to the Board of Health rules. So if you have enough space for four campers and you're charging three of them rent, you're running a campground under the terms of the Board of Health regulations. Correct. And, and there was, I just want to, again, clarification, there were two other reasons. It wasn't always for profit. There were two other reasons too. And one of them was charitable and one of them was that philanthropy type where you're doing it for the good of, you know, helping others. So there, all three of those were under that same regulation. And I, I think the goal is just a reflection that the more, the more, the more people there are and the closer there are, the more there is a public health concern. And that's why it's in the state, it's actually the state sanitary code. It's not the Hadley Board of Health regulations, but it is the state regulations that the Board of Health is charged with enforcing. So uh, once, no Hadley part. once again, we just loop back into one of the areas that I mentioned earlier, even if zoning says you could have multiple um, multiple RVs on a given parcel, you still have to be mindful that if you cross certain lines, it doesn't matter what zoning says. If, um, if you cross that line and you do fall under the uh, state sanitary code, um, you're governed by that regardless of what the zoning says. Right, it's like overlaying regs. And no farmer ever sold the bushel of cucumbers for cash either. Um, so, Rob Baranowski, you still have your hand up. Did you have anything more to say? Okay, um, no. No, I, I, I would say no. Um, so I'll take my hand out. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, someone did mention in the comments that not all Zoom reactions have raised the hand. That would be, uh, that would mean you don't have the most current um, Zoom client, I would, I believe. So uh, you might want to check in. Okay. If anybody me, else me. wants to Go on. If anyone else wants to say anything, I'd suggest you just turn your camera on. That if you can't, if you can't wave, raise a hand. Nobody else wants to say anything. There will be another meeting of the River Working Group on Thursday at six. If anybody wants to be there and hasn't received the agenda, you can either contact Tom at the building department or you can contact me at planning at hadleyma.org and I will forward the meeting notice to you. Could you forward that to me, Bill, please? Yes. And, and Bill, there's nothing that says that the interested parties, i.e. the people that have vehicles down there, couldn't propose a bylaw. Well, it, it, that's true. In fact, one did. Uh, I did okay. send around something I just received today from John uh, Tchaikovsky, who edited um, edited my draft from two weeks ago. Uh, so you can take a look at that. Okay. You know, they can propose what they want, Michael, but it has to pass the mustard of the state as well. So I understand that. That's not my point. The point is they, they could they, they could get they could get, hire their own lawyer and they could draft the bylaw that passed the muster of the state, correct? Yeah, but and also gonna go by town meeting and be approved. Exactly. Exactly. Anybody anybody else have any comments on this riverfront bylaw right now? Or this riverfront issue, I wouldn't say bylaw. Yeah. Nobody's saying anything. Yeah, I just wild, wild the forge. Go ahead. 
Yeah, you guys were saying about if you rent out your piece of property to people, then it falls under a business. Now, it falls under the campground regulations of the state sanitary code. If you okay, so three or so more. So my property, I have it's all family, like cousins and my uncles and stuff like that. So I don't fall. I still got to fall for that special permit if I have three or more. You're saying that you don't charge your family? Is that the question? No, I mean, I mean, how can you charge your uncle and your cousin? You know, that's... The state sanitary code is has quite a few sectors to it. And you might fall under the, still may fall under the state sanitary code. Even though you don't charge. Uh, right. let, let me show you the section here. Uh, yeah, there's too many things on my desktop. Um, because I know exactly how many how much footage I have for waterfront. Oh, here it is. This is the definition: family type campground, campground or camp, tract or parcel of land, privately or publicly owned which is used wholly or in part for recreational camping and which accommodates for profit three or more families. So if you are there yeah. and you are not charging anyone, yeah. you can have more than, uh, but if you are charging anyone, if you are charging three, um, if you're charging for three, you are a campground and you are subject to the Board of Health regulation. All right. So, so like I said, I mean, I don't charge my uncles and my cousins. Wait, so wait, I still, wait, I still, still have to back. go through the Board of Health and all that for the permits and correct? I don't know how that philanthropic okay. and charitable okay. is. That's, uh, I would, I would say for, you got the, the purple, which accommodates for profit. Or under philo, philo, yeah. philanthropic. philanthropic or charitable offices, does that mean even, even if you don't charge and you're charitable to them, you fall to the same thing, Bill? That might well. So you, even if you don't charge, you may fall under this category. Because of the amount of waste produced is probably the, the exactly, concern. Mark. I mean, you, it, you can't get an absolution by saying you're non- you're, You're not, not for profit, and then you have no sandy cans, no sanitary. You could have held Woodstock on your farm and not <laughs> charged them, but you're going to need sandy cans. <laughs> yeah. We have people come in and pump our trailers out. Okay, and that would that would be fine. Uh, yeah. Just we're we're just telling you that we're discussing a zoning bylaw, right. but it is a small. It is only one slice of the pie, it's and it's not the last word. Yeah, we understand that. We just, we figure, you know, we have 675 feet of waterfront, and all the trailers that we usually have are like 50 feet apart. And that still gives us like 200 or something feet extra. And that might work out. That might work out fine. Again, part of it is that this is is hard to put together a bylaw that addresses every square foot of river frontage fairly and equally, because not every square foot is the same. There are right. some areas where you can you sort of wade right out into the water. Um, I have riverfront property and it is, uh, probably close to a, f it's two 20 foot drops to get down to water level. We have like, I want to say it's a football field to the water, maybe even more. And, and, and that, that's, you know, that, that's a point that's all over the place. You've got some places where 
you've got sandy beaches going into the water and you've got some places where it's like bill says a huge drop and right you need a an elevator to get to the water right and it sounds like most of the people are are being very reasonable and smart about how they do it but it's it it's there's some onus on us to provide some type of structure i think for those who don't have the common sense that most of these people do yeah yeah i have a raised hand for mark Britton, and i also have kevin o'brien who has gone live and is actually raising his own hand so mark i saw first if you want to take him first Hey, good evening. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. So, would would it be would it be smarter to adopt a bylaw similar to the state requirements, like you know, with with the family campground um, verbiage written in the in the Hadley bylaw, so there so it would be more streamlined oh, no. because you still have conservation and board of health and the fire department. They're all going to have their their say in in this um, in, in having campers down the river. I mean, just so in parallel along with the state, wouldn't that wouldn't that be a more advisable thing to do? I'll tell you, there, there are a couple of reasons we try to avoid tracking state language and regulations too closely, and that is that they change. So we could incorporate by reference, but um, but really, if, if you just want one one RV or two, the um, the state sanitary code's probably a little bit of overkill. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, we're, we're also trying to be it provide an education here that um, it applies. It may apply. Depends on what you're doing. Yeah, I think if I don't know if that's what Mark Britton was speaking to, but I think, you know, if I put myself in your shoes, it would be really nice if the town of Hadley could give you a checklist. Here's the things you need to do to to know that you've done it right. But as Bill said, from our standpoint, if we make a checklist, it might be accurate today, but tomorrow, you know, there's there's, you know, dozens of regulatory um, organizations that we don't have any say over and if they change and our list doesn't change, it's not dynamic, then we've misled you. So it's kind of, you know, we'd like to help you, but we don't want to mislead you either. So why, why would the planning board even get involved then if, if all these other departments have their own um, rules and regulations? I mean, and, and what Mr. Dwyer said about the, you know, having one or two campers, the, the sanitary uh, regulations might be a little strict. I mean, why not be super strict on sanitary conditions, especially because it's along our waterway. I, I want to see clear water, not brown water. And I think that goes for a lot of other people that own riverfront properties, including, you know, people with houses, not, not, not to mention campers. But I mean, I, I, I think everybody that owns property there should have some sort of, you know, um, requirement a strict strict sanitary um requirement out there just because you know we want to we don't want to see our natural resources get ruined so part of it is that we don't necessarily have the jurisdiction through the zoning bylaw to require sandy cans uh that is more in the hands of the board of health um the reason the planning board is involved is because our bylaw is written in such a way, it's in the first paragraph of the bylaw, it basically says the following activities are permitted in the town of Hadley and anything not permitted is prohibited. So having an RV along the river was never permitted. It was never mentioned in the original bylaw, which was adopted in the 1960s when people probably didn't spend much time down by the river uh, for good reason. Um, but until we adopted a bylaw saying that you could have 
an RV down by the river, you had no, you did not have the right to do it. And that's our involvement in that we've amended the zoning bylaw to create the opportunity to take your campers down, down to your RV down to the river. Uh, you didn't have that as a lawful option before the bylaw was adopted. And that's why we're involved in it. Uh, Kevin O'Brien had his hand up, Jim. Yeah. Hi, how are you, um, everybody? Um, yeah, Bill, I was just, um, when you had that bylaw up and about the um, for profit only, I think what they're kind of talking about is kind of like um, on those other ends, it's kind of like Girl Scout camps as well as other family religious camps. You know how people have um, campgrounds all over the state where um, I think because they don't, they're considered nonprofit and they don't get profit, but I still would think they would have to fall under the health department regulations as well as everybody talked about with uh, waste and other things. So that's where I kind of just wanted to kind of get that out there. Um, I think that's what they're kind of attending to because not all campgrounds are for profit or on that end. But, um, but thank you. Uh, everybody on the panel. Yeah, th so this is Rob Baranowski again. It, it's just going to beg to ask the question then, how are people, if somebody wants to have, as, as Lionel was talking, four of their um, relatives staying on, they're not charging them. And now we were just talking about that diagram said two RVs per lot because you know, we kept thinking that three or more had to go through some sort of other permitting, but now we're questioning that permitting and no, needing that permitting. So I'm back to confused. If somebody wants four, what do they do? Say that again now? I, I'm just confused. If, if somebody wants four RVs on their property, what do they do? I, I was under the impression that it would have to go through that other, you know, law, that other Massachusetts law 105 CMR 440. But if we're saying that's for profit only or things like Girl Scouts or church groups, then what is the permitting process if you want four per lot? We haven't got there yet. Okay. Because we're still discussing all of this. I mean, I don't know where church groups came up. I mean, charitable organization can simply mean you're not charging your relatives. It doesn't have to be a bona fide type C charity. And, like and I other, agree. This other gentleman One says he, he doesn't charge his relatives, so he's not considered a campground. Under the regulation, he might be considered a campground because Correct. he has simply enough trailers or, or RVs on his property. So we're, we're, we are working through the bylaw right now on trying to design it on what is reasonable based on some kind of frontage or lot size. And we're, that's, where we're, that's where we are right now. Oh. Yeah, I agree with you that I read that law to say, as it does say family style campgrounds. So to me, that's why I was assuming that if you wanted three or more, that's what would kick in. Um, I do agree with uh, Mark Britton in terms of you know, streamline the process because it does sound that if you are going to want four, you are going to need four to health anyways. So why not make this whole permitting process saying, okay, you're always going to have to go through board of health. If you're going through board of health, maybe as he said, and you have four more, three or more, you just need, you know, an addendum page that says, okay, show me your pump out service or your sanitation or your waste removal that sort of stuff, because otherwise, again, Board of Health, if that is an entire separate separate permitting, and they're involved with the original permitting, to me, it's just going to be a nightmare for Board of Health. So I, I, I don't think we have the authority um, through zoning to do, uh, to structure it that way. Uh, and I could see certainly at the um, at the level when you are applying through the building inspector for your permit and he goes through the checklist, which this other committee is developing. And um, 
what one thing is if you have four there you may need to be able to prove to the board of health that you're not a campground you know you you have to prove that you are me my uncle and my uh my two cousins um but i don't i i i can't speak for the board of health and yes i know it is it is work for them but it is also it's their jurisdiction we can't take that over from them i don't think I don't, I don't even know, would they want to see evidence that you're having your tanks pumped or something? You know, that's, that yes. might interest them. Yes. So we, it's interesting. The Board of Health does have a low threshold. Looks like everybody froze. I don't know if you can hear me. <clears throat> it seems that the Board of Health has a low threshold of uh, three or more units. Um, and maybe, maybe they should as a practical matter, or maybe the building inspector as the, uh, the flood, uh, flood manager uh, may want to say that you should comply. That's, that's, again, it's beyond our jurisdiction under the, as a planning board to make all of those requirements. So, so basically I've, I've actually started a draft on an application to really simplify it. And, um, you know, after everybody reviews it, you know, Board of Health all, um, the only one that as a, as a um, the first one I have to go to is conservation. The application won't include anything of that. You'll just have to go to your, the conservation with your plan. And depending on what the planning board decides, square footage, amount of campers, anything over that would, would trigger ZBA. But on the application, it should simplify where as long as you don't trigger anything that you know, Board of Health already said they want to know where the uh, waste is going. You just got to list a company, um, you know, uh, different things like that. So we're trying to simplify it so they wouldn't even have to be involved unless you triggered something, said you didn't have a company or, you know, you were over the setback of the 25 feet between campers. Um, trying to make it, you know, one, one sheet just to fill out. But basically the planning board is going to determine, you know, how many square feet, they, they want to require per per camper and how many per lot and then conservation would go from there so if i could add one thing to rob baranowski's question the um what was put up was the, the drawing that was put up was based on um someone who had 80 feet of river frontage and that supported two units uh if you have larger parcel um you may support more units. If we do a structure that has an amount of square footage and an amount of separation, then uh, you may uh, you may support more. We, uh, Mark Dunn and I were looking at the tax maps and identified one property in the uh, Aquavita section that had something like f only 40 feet of frontage. Yeah, there was like 44 feet but it was a 1.4 acre parcel, just a long skinny strip going down from uh, Aquavita Road to the river. Now that one, yeah, you could it'll support one, maybe support two, but it, even though you have 1.4 acres, you don't have a lot of maneuvering room there. And again, not every parcel is going to be usable because some may not be as accessible as others. I still think, you know, we're, li we're listening to the, the people who want more trailers and want their trailers there. But as town officials, we also have to look at what is the town going to look like? If, for example, the last time somebody said, well, we have eight or nine trailers on our four acre parcel. And Boy, that's, that amounts to a lot of trailers up and down the river. Do we want that situation in Hadley? That, and do we want people coming in from out of town? Because uh, in spite of the fact that someone says they're, they're in Northampton, Northampton doesn't allow it, Hatfield doesn't allow it, Sunland doesn't allow it. And uh, where are people going to go? I mean, we could be literally looking at four, 500 trailers or more along the Connecticut River in Hadley. Do we want to see that? Well, 
I'll, just my perspective, I don't see it. Now, I don't go out on the river, so I don't see what the Hadley shoreline looks like. And I don't have reasons to go down to uh, Aquavita or Honey Pot. So. Okay, uh, I, I have. I have gone down the Aquavita. I've gone down the Sandy Beach. And that sandbar there, uh, right off of Sandy Beach, first of all, I counted 100 boats there. And there were trailers parked up and down that section there. Then you go down the honey pot, there's even more. Then you go down, uh, as you go south, there's some trailers there. And of course, the marina. And I know the Barstows are always trying to keep the campers out with their tents and their land. So uh, do we allow tents too? But I'm, I'm just raising that point and uh, I'm not advocating one, one way or the other yet. And you're right, it's, it's a situation we all boards have to get involved and we have to find out really how, how much authority does the uh, Conservation Commission have? And they have a lot of authority. Okay. Tom, have you given any, any thought to an appropriate fee to be charged per vehicle? I mean, if you got 400, campers down there and you charge $250 per camper per, for inspection, that's $100,000. Uh, and, you know, I, this, this is going to cost the town something to go through this. And I, you've got to be compensated for it, at least cover the cost and then some. Yeah. There's going to be some kind of a reasonable fee because all these inspections, especially if the Board of Health gets this involved, they're going, they may have to hire somebody to do some of this stuff. So the fee has to be commensurate with whatever the, the actual costs are. You know, the campers are gonna to have to realize that they're gonna, there's gonna cost some money for them to go down here from now on. See, the, the way we were kind of working on the form was it, you know, as long as they fig, you know, filled it out, that it, they had all their answers, you know, and they're gonna sign it just like a billing permit. Um, perjury, whatever the, the correct uh, word is there at the bottom wording, um, you know, everything's true and accurate, that as long as it didn't trigger it, you know, we wouldn't have to go out and inspect them. It would be, a, you know, what we talked about in the, in the meeting so far was a three-year permit. And, you know, I didn't know, we even talked about whether it be per, per parcel, per camper, or, or how, but just, you know, try to keep it at a minimum. The, the big thing is going to be the conservation out there um, as far as what they're going to see originally, they may need to get out and look at the properties. Yeah. They always do. Okay. Yeah, but I, I, Jim, you, uh, yeah, I think everyone was absolutely right that, that there is a cost to this and we have been bearing the cost to this of this without charge to this point, but it has to be structured. And um, I know you were saying that if, if it was done through the electronic system, there'd be a minimum charge. Um, and yeah, there, there's, there's no harm in there being a minimum charge for, um, for the work that's involved, even if it is just your work in going through each application yeah. to see that it's complete. What's the charge for an accessory apartment? 250? 350. 350. Oh. So that's our well, filing that's, fee. But, but that includes publication costs in a newspaper and mailings. Yeah. Well and that's well, something else we're gonna address because the the we're probably a, before long we're gonna have to raise that fee because a single ad in a newspaper lately for the accessory of departments have been running as $330. Ooh. It's gone way up on their costs. So anyway, that's a different topic. Next, next action is bill is the meeting on Thursday night then? That's correct. I sent everyone uh, the um, agenda and the Zoom link. Okay. I think you got one more hand up. Mark Britton? I think that's still up. I think you just didn't okay. take it down. Okay.
Any other comments right now on this proposal? I can't see any hands raised. Put your screen on so I can see if you want to have any, anything to say, please. Okay. Next topic, Mr. Dwyer, anything? Uh, no, I think uh, if you want to get, we uh, have that invoice to approve for that webinar. Oh, yeah. Right. And I forget what the, Mike, do you remember, or Mark, do you remember what the, uh, the acronym was for that affordable housing webinar we went to? Was that CHAPA, C-H-A-P-P-A? -P -P yeah, yeah, right, right. And I think it was 20, I think it was $75, 25 yeah, each. 75. I think Mike paid for mine. Yeah, we, we got an invoice, the town accountant, I mean, not the, the uh, town administrator has, a, has an invoice for $75 to pay for the meeting fee. I'll, I'll entertain a motion for, to pay the meeting fee, to pay the $75 invoice. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I will get that approved to the uh, back to the town administrator. Um, anything else? I don't. Uh, let me see. The. Um, Someone from Mass Highway is going to be at the select board meeting tomorrow night to talk about Route 9 plans. Okay. Uh, we've already discussed the town council. Um, and I think the other items are uh, just uh, placeholders. So I think that's it. Okay. Anything else, Tom? Nothing. Okay. Nope. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thanks for thanks for putting through, through a checklist. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Have a good night. Motion to adjourn. So moved. And seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting of history. Thank you, and thank you, John. Good night. Good night.